we've got Bill along here to tell us about um, his experience with robots and robot singing. So, Bill, would you please explain yourself? Hey, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so I'm Bill Huckberg, and I'm uh, uh, an intellectual property and entertainment attorney based in Santa Monica, California. And it's a great pleasure to be here at the Music Tech Fest and here in Berlin. First time here. I, I'm fascinated by it. So this talk is about, um, it's based around actually an article uh, that I wrote in the uh, Atlantic um, about, entitled, When Robots Write uh, when Robots Write Songs, and you can Google that to get uh, the article if you'd like to read it, or we can uh, send it to you if you come up to me afterwards. Anyway, uh, we'll just jump right into it. The uh, issue My was first was Mr. Langley, broached by the wonderful Stanley Cooper. And he taught me to remember sing this song. scene. If you'd like to hear it, from I 2001. I'd like to hear it now. Take it for me. It's called Daisy. Anybody out there seen Daisy. 2001 A Space Odyssey? Yeah. And by the way, if anyone wants to uh, raise a question it during the, my talk or make a point or comment, please do so. Um, you know, it's an open I should, conversation if we crazy. like. All for the love. So we, we won't have to listen to the whole thing, but uh, it's interesting that that uh, Stanley Kubrick really back in 1969, uh, I believe, really uh, got this, this uh, question about robots and humans, and it was picked up in a later movie, The Matrix, if any of you saw the first Matrix. Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote it, and yes, of course, and Kubrick did the movie and captured that uh, brilliantly. So, um, moving right along here, if I can. So this, oops, the article, so a little bit of technical problem here. Maybe it'll stay. Um, I got the idea uh, to write this article after seeing a French team, Sony Computer Science Labs in Paris, uh, who were working on some um, interesting projects. Let me try to get out of this and let you actually listen to some of what they were doing. Some interesting um, robotic music, using algorithms to create all sorts of different um, original music created by, by uh, computers. So if I can get this link to work, will play one of their first ones, which is a jazz uh, program that takes the saxophone of Charlie Parker and fuses it with Pierre Boulet uh, in some kind of a fashion. Um, and I'll play a little bit of it for you. Actually, here's um, Bill Evans. I'm going to play that for you rather than, we'll get to the other one later. Uh, Bill Evans is perhaps the greatest jazz pianist of the 20th century. And this is a computer uh, doing what I think is a, a pretty lousy job of, uh, interpret of, of imitating Bill Evans. But you make your decision. Tell me what you think. It's... So it has, Bill Evans was known for his lush cordings and a lot of arpeggios that just cascaded and went on and on. Uh, there was just, there's something really uh, otherworldly about his playing. And the computer program does get the, the cordings and it gets uh, some of the um, uh, arpeggiated feel of it. But uh, as I said in the article, it's, um, yeah, Bill Evans was also a, a, a terribly addicted drug addict as well, and he was I actually a, represented a producer of a lot of his music who would drive him to his recording sessions, and he would be doped up on heroin very often, but he, and he would be slouched over and as if he were asleep at the piano, but he'd be playing the most marvelous, incredible music, which was just unfathomable 
Um, but the computer version of him sounds like it's, uh, as I said in the, in the article, sounds like the computer is doped up on Windows 8 and, uh, and Thorazine. Um, so not the greatest, uh, but other, another program by this French team really um, is pretty phenomenal. I'll see if I can get you that one. Um, it's the one that I mentioned earlier, which is Charlie Parker and Pierre Boulet. And so that we'll give that one a try. See if I can find that one. Okay. Uh, Pat Matheny, uh, the great jazz guitarist, uh, I interviewed him for this article, and he was quite impressed with this, uh, this one. Let's see if I can... Here we go. I think this is it. Yeah. So Pat Metheny took that uh, track and he played it for the sax player in his band and asked him if he knew who it was. And the sax player immediately started naming names of people. And that was, as Pat pointed out, that was the, the Turing test. Um, Alan Turing, uh, one of the creators of, of uh, today's uh, computers that we have, uh, had a test where he would play, uh, or he, he would have humans having conversations uh, with others, and they didn't know whether it was other humans or uh, computers. And if they were stumped and they thought it was a computer, then, the, then it, the program passed the test. So he thought that passed that test. There are other um, teams around the world that are working on this. There's one very impressive guy named David Cope. David Cope, uh, out of... Uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz um, has a program that uh, you all have you listen to it. It emulates Bach. Let's take a listen to this. from him. I, I was quite impressed. Any of you feel, uh, have any impressions of this? Yeah. Well, yeah. To, to me, distortion is emotion. And um, what, what a lot of uh, my vinyl-loving friends, and I was a vinyl collector, loved about vinyl was that they said it was felt warmer. And what they're listening to is distortion. So what's distortion is actually what makes something special rather than ubiquitously the same. Okay. Yeah. You want to take the microphone? Yeah, the, the, the thing that comes to mind is that, that uh, when, when I hear music that's produced by a computer that has, that has an algorithm that includes distortion, literally distortion, um, from, an exact, from an exact frequency, it brings about a human feel. And in that regard, you know, I, I, I was a vinyl collector when I was young, <clears throat> and um, I made the switch to CDs because I really appreciated the clarity and I appreciated the convenience and I was getting rid of my vinyl and I had friends that were collective others said, well, you're crazy, they sound so cold and I said no, actually, they sound like it was. What you're listening to on the vinyl is distorted, but you fall in love with the distortion because it feels human and human beings are like that, so that's what I hear that. Yeah, I think there's, um, I, I take away from what you're saying that there's some, something about imperfection that's human, you know, that if you have a computer that's perfect. Uh, but uh, one of the 
computer uh, scientists that I talked to said, well, we can, we can tweak that. We can make it a little imperfect. Um, we can make, uh, you know, I, I, I asked, well, can a computer really swing? Okay, a swing in a jazz sense of just really kind of a, a great jazz sax player like John Coltrane, he would be very often a little sharp, a little high, uh, but there was high probably in other ways sometimes, but he would uh, technically, and his timing sometimes would come, would be a little bit um, in front of the beat and so forth, um, but you know, the, these are, are things that can be fed into an algorithm uh, according to some of these people. So the question really comes down to is there anything uh, that humans can do that a, that a computer can't do in this way. Pat Metheny thinks that um, really a computer is just a, an aid to a, to a human and that it's really a, f a reflection of the person who wrote the, the program. Ray Kurzweil, the futurist and uh, inventor of synthesizers, um, his question was, you know, who is the artist when we listen to something like this? Is it um, the, the person who is it the computer that's creating this Mozart-style music that we're about to hear? Is it the person who wrote the program? Or is it actually Mozart? Um, well, can, you give, can you give a computer a shot of philosophy? <laughs> Another good question. So we'll play a little bit of the Mozart. Anyone have any feeling about that? Did that seem human to anyone? I, uh, one of the things that I, I find really interesting about that is that uh, from the examples that you've played, the more natural the instrument itself sounds, the more our ears are drawn towards the, the, um, uh, the idea that it might be a human being playing. So if that had been played identically, note for note, by a MIDI sounding piano noise, uh, rather than something that actually sounded more like a piano, like that did, uh, it would it would be less convincing. Is there something about the kind of the uh, the this kind of perceived authenticity of of wooden and string instruments, even if there are computers playing them, um, that that feels more composed by a human because it's performed on a on a on a, a handmade instrument? I think yeah, I, I I think yeah that it's the instrument itself. Um, especially if it's a handmade instrument. Uh, perhaps it does have some more human feel to it. Another point that Pat Metheny raised that I, I was really interested in, wasn't able to cover it in my article, but might make, a, might make it for another article, is that he believes that speakers are really inferior, that it's, it's the missing link. Speakers, any speaker is really just a piece of cardboard that moves air. And it's really the missing link in audio. Audio has really uh, achieved some pretty high miles in terms of the technology, but the speakers themselves are very primitive. And so what Pat Metheny did, I talk about this a bit in the article, is he actually took something called an orchestrion. He had it made for him. And an orchestrion is, um, it's like a player piano, but it's a whole orchestra, it's a whole, it can be 20. Um, I don't have that on there. We can look at that, yeah. Um, but it's, um, so it's actually the instruments playing rather than speakers. And so he wanted to get the sound coming from instruments rather than speakers. And his question is, what can we do to advance ourselves beyond speakers? And maybe in the future, 20 years, 50 years from now, speakers will be a, a thing of the past. And, and it really, we don't, but we, our ears are used to speakers, you know, and we don't recognize the difference. But if you were to listen to music being played by, through speakers versus a live, say, quartet and be in the room with that, it would be a completely different experience, of course. Um, so let me just move on to another one. OK, we have now uh, a Chopin. Uh, one, one point I wanted to make was also, I, I love Glenn Gould, getting back to Bach. And one of the things I love is hearing him 
in the background, you know, humming along or singing along or screaming while he's playing. And I don't, that's something that might do that, but somehow uh, I don't think so. It would be great if we could program Keith Jarrett to not do it. Thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah. That piano sounded humidified. You said so. He's David Cope is really very brilliant, and um, I uh, actually wasn't able to get a hold of him. He was one of the only people in the article, him and Ray Kurzweil, that I didn't actually speak to uh, or communicate through email with. Um, but I was so impressed with him, and according to uh, to my to my friend Vincent here, he's actually. Uh, as I understand, David Cope is really averse to a lot of public uh, attention, but he's a genius, I think. He's, I think he's, his work is the most impressive I've seen in this area. Um, so there's more, and I, in my article, um, if you go to the article online, there's links to a lot of this. But we could move on um, to some other aspects here that I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to touch on some of the legal issues that, that might arise with this kind of music. Uh, and I, I don't know how much back, I just want to give you a little basic background on, on music quickly. Um, do you un all understand that there are two copyrights involved? One for the, the actual composition, which is the circle with the C, and another for the actual recording of the composition, or the, the circle with a P for phonogram. And, um, for example, what's this? This is something else. Okay, well this is a client of mine, Lalo Schifrin, who created L Mission Impossible, uh, and the composition is on the left, and the recording is here. Um, any number of recordings of the same composition, this one by Danny Elfman, uh, but it's, it's the same copyright in the, in the music, but a different copyright in the recording of it. So that's an important thing to understand when we talk about the legal aspects of this um, and who the owners are of the different copyrights. Um, the owner can be a record company or a production company. <laughs> and then the owner of the music publishing can be the same person. <laughs> or it could be, uh, in this, in the case of, of um, Lalo Schifrin, uh, Marty Bandier, yes, of Sony. OK, I'm sorry. So you have the owner, the record label, and the uh, publisher uh, who are controlling the circle C copyright, which is for the music itself, the composition, and the circle P, or the recording, is uh, usually owned by a record label, or nowadays by the actual artist, often. Um, and, oh, Tom Cruise also has, he doesn't have any copyright in the Mission Impossible theme, but he does have a control, control over when it can be used for commercials and things, because of that, they just let him do that, because he's, he doesn't have any publishing, uh, but because Tom Cruise has a lot of power and he doesn't like people, uh, he doesn't, he puts his... Uh... So, um, we need to, to, if Tom Cruise were a robot, would that, could robotics solve this intellectual property problem? Um, uh, so, if you have a robot, uh, which is creating music in the style of a living 
person or someone like Bill Evans, who's a state, he, he passed away a de couple decades ago, but his estate still has copyright. So, uh, or someone living today, if, some, if a computer were to uh, create music in the style of Paul McCartney, for example, uh, would Paul McCartney have a lawsuit potentially to prevent that computer uh, from either creating new original mu music? No, because we're not talking about the Circle C composition because these computers are creating original new music. And we're not talking about the Circle P because it's not a specific recording of the original artist. What we're talking about is sound alikes. We're talking about rhythm that sounds like an artist. That's pretty much what he says that sounds like an, an like user. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so sound is that uh, covers this. It's not exactly on, on a cover. It's something that has a look and feel or sound of something that's close enough that someone says, hey, that's me. You're taking that for me. Um, and, and Tom Waits, uh, everyone know, anyone know who Tom Waits is? Maybe you do. Tom Waits is uh, famous in addition to his gravelly voice that's been described as sounding like somebody gargling with razor blades or a sandpapery type of a sound. He's also known for suing a lot of people for using his voice. He gets approached or had been approached by a number of companies to use to his singing voice for commercials. Audi, Opel, and Fritos were three of them, and he refused, and then they said, fine, we'll just get somebody who sounds like you, which is something that advertising agencies do a lot. Um, and they have to be careful that they don't go over the line into sound-alikes. You had, here's, here's the most famous of Tom Waits's songs. This gives you his voice. So Doritos uh, was the first uh, victim. So they, they had approached uh, Tom Waits. Tom Waits said no, he was not uh, willing to do a commercial. And so they hired someone who sounded like him to do a commercial for Doritos. Uh, they were sued in, in the United States in 1990, and uh, there was a judgment for two and a half million dollars. Uh, so in the United States, it's known that, that the United States is the most litigious country. Uh, but in Europe, uh, the same thing. We had uh, in 2005 an Audi commercial in Spain. And uh, so it was about 70, almost $80,000, a, a much lower amount of money. Um, but uh, it was for... Actually, they thought it was copy, a form of copyright infringement, and they also thought it was a violation of, of the moral rights. So they use different terminology, but it's the same thing. And then right here in Berlin, uh, there was a case uh, for the Opal. And here, I think I have it here. Let's see if it's the commercial itself. Oops. Well, this is... Hang on. I think I have the actual... Commercial, hold on. Bear with me for one moment. Oh, I guess not. Anyway, this is a, a firm here uh, in Berlin, and this gentleman, Andreas Spies, a uh, brilliant lawyer, he uh, sued Opal, and they uh, settled the case. So I'm giving a shout out to uh, my friend Andreas Spies for a job well done. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, so here's the commercial that actually was the problem right here. And there's a robot, too. Who you knew? So even though it's a human here, it could be a robot as well. Wouldn't have to pay uh, union scale. Well, this...
particular uh, commercial, they, they settled it and there was no, it was not public what the amount of money was for the settlement, but, uh, you know. Anyway, yeah, so Opal in 2005, um, you know, they had approached him and anyway, it came out that they had approached him and he had said no and uh, they went ahead and did that commercial anyway, so. So in theory, if they had not approached him, they could have done it by the laws. So in theory, he said if they hadn't, that, that's a good question. Uh, in theory, his question is if, if um, he had not been approached, if the um, advertising agency had not approached uh, Tom Waits, but just had used a uh, singer that sounded like him, uh, would they have been liable? I, it, would, sir, it would not be considered um, willful, maybe, although it might be. It would be tricky, but I, I would submit to you that advertising agencies always do this. They're always trying to capitalize, but they are very subtle and very clever about <laughs> And, and someone, uh, you did a good impression of Tom Waits there. Louis Armstrong. Actually, really? it was Louis Armstrong. You're right. And that's something that someone had, uh, one commentator. So what is Tom doing, right? I'm sorry? And so what is Tom doing? That's the point. What this gentleman just said is that maybe uh, the real Frito Bandito is Tom Waits, <laughs> right? That he was taking Louis Armstrong's voice, in a sense. And, and what are the, so he's the robot that's uh, channeling. Louis Armstrong, perhaps. Yeah. Um, you know, and this, this uh, raises some interesting questions. Um, so, a really do. quick question ab yeah. about what this means for copyright. If we're getting technologies that compose music, uh, technologies that perform music in the style of humans, technologies that create music, um, and, uh, and, and collaborate with musicians and, and do those sorts of things. Are we sufficiently com uh, adding complexity to copyright to make it start to fall to bits? Because it, it feels like e every single instance is a patch. Everything has to be corrected now in order to make for every new instance. Like for instance, we, you and I talked yesterday about uh, a computer that we had at Music Tech Fest in London that composes classical music. And it can be asked to compose classical music in the style of certain composers. But also, the idea of it is that they generate hundreds of thousands of snippets of works that can be used by composers as a kind of a shortcut tool to create new works. Um, and, and that's the point of it. But the, the question for me that comes out from a legal perspective is, doesn't copyright fall to bits at some point? Well, I mean, that... Um that's a debate, certainly. I mean, there, there are those who really feel that copyright is not uh, serving a purpose in terms of um, more creativity. I mean, in the time of Shakespeare, there was no uh, copyright. Um, but certainly in the United States, I mean, people, there, there was one case involving one kick drum beat from John Bonham, the drummer of Led Zeppelin, uh, and it was recognized as a sample, and that one kick drum beat was the basis for, for a lawsuit. So, you know, I, and, but in the case of a computer, again, as I was mentioning earlier in the conversation we were talking, um, I would submit that it w may not be a copyright infringement, but it would be something on the order of a sound alike, or some would say a trademark infringement to sound too much like so-and-so. Bet, Bet Midler had a case like that involving uh, Ford Motor Company. Is that about passing off? This and, idea of passing off as somebody? Right. Right. Either the sound. There was a, an IBM commercial, I believe, that had someone who looked like Charlie Chaplin, um, but they didn't have permission. So it's look-alike, sound-alike. And a computer um, wouldn't get around that problem, I would submit. Somebody is making money from the commercial. The computer is not a living breathing being, but somebody is who's somebody programming owns that computer. it. Yes. Um, and it's no different than hiring an actor or a, or a singer and programming them to sound like so-and-so or instructing them. Brilliant. Bill, yeah, thank you so uh, much. It's, very it's, well. Uh, very, very much of a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a really kind of, it's an interesting aspect that gets brought up in a lot of these conversations about music and technology and that intersection because it's changing so rapidly. The idea of what is the, the context within which 
we do things. If we're hacking, if we're making new types of musical instruments, if we're taking, making new types of musical performance, if everybody is a collaborator in music, if you can stand on the other side of that wall and just by moving compose music, are you a composer? Have you written a piece of music? Is the, is the software the thing that wrote the music? Are the people who wrote the software the thing that wrote the music? It's, it's, a, it's a fraught, intense area. I don't think we're going to solve it today, but thank oh. you so much for coming oh, yeah. along and outlining the, uh, the parameters well, of I it wanna, for us. I want to thank the audience. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Let's get out of the audience. And uh, thank you again. It's a pleasure being here. Cheers. Thank you, Bill.